This video has no spoilers for House of the Dragon Season 2 or beyond. It's that time of year again. The holidays have come, family and friends are joined together, and they're arguing about which members of the monarchy are most deserving of drawn-out painful deaths. I don't normally give my opinions on House of the Dragon. I just hijack the wonderful footage for B-roll when I'm talking about the books. But I thought, as a little holiday treat, we could all yell at each other in the comments about the incest show. But seriously, I really like House of the Dragon overall, and hopefully my criticisms about certain bits of plot and characterization are constructive. So keep that in mind, and remember, it's just a TV show. The showrunners have made it very clear that this series, at its core, is about the relationship between Rhaenyra Targaryen and Alicent Hightower. The novella it's based on is titled The Princess and the Queen, so it's fitting that after the prologue, Rhaenyra and Alicent are the first two characters to share the screen together. This is their story, so if any characters need to be consistently well written throughout, it's these two. Alicent is aged down about nine years to be close to Rhaenyra's age. They are best friends until Alicent is used by Otto to seduce a grieving Viserys, and she becomes his new wife. She tries to make peace with Rhaenyra, and accomplishes this off-screen between episodes 3 and 4. But in episode 5, Alicent learns that Rhaenyra lied to her about having premarital sex. She feels betrayed, since she defended Rhaenyra to the king and thought they were close enough friends to tell each other the truth. So she wears a new dress and goes full-on green. After the 10-year time skip, Alicent is extremely cold to Rhaenyra. It's clear that they butt heads constantly, and the main source of Alicent's frustration is Rhaenyra's bastard sons, whose parentage she lies about. Alicent is angry that the rules are different for Rhaenyra. She was forced to marry Viserys and give him heirs, while Rhaenyra was given the freedom to choose her own husband, and yet still had the audacity to have bastards, which would unfairly come before Alicent's trueborn sons in the succession. Ever since she became a teen mom, Alicent was instilled with anti rhaenyra rhetoric from her father Otto, who told her that Aegon must become king or else his life would be in danger and war will happen. War will follow, do you understand? After everything that's happened between her and Rhaenyra, it makes sense that Alicent would be on board with this rhetoric come episode 6, when she hits Aegon and yells at him to stop being worthless or else Rhaenyra will murder him for simply existing. Things get a whole lot worse in episode 7, when Aemon's eye is cut out by Rhaenyra's bastard son. Alicent is fed up with Rhaenyra's ability to shirk any consequences for her actions. So she attacks Rhaenyra with a prophecy dagger. Another six years later, Alicent still hates Rhaenyra, she gives her and Daemon a lackluster reception to King's Landing, and colludes with Daemon Velaryon to take Driftmark from Lucerys. But that night at family dinner, Rhaenyra makes a toast in Alicent's honor, which she returns. It seems as though Viserys' triumphant stand in the throne room convinced Alicent that Rhaenyra would have no trouble succeeding him, and given that she's very disappointed with Aegon, her drunken, rapey tool to take away Rhaenyra's inheritance, Alicent makes amends with Rhaenyra. We are shown that despite the women's ability to reconcile, their years of hatred have already seeped into their children. The situation was now out of their hands and into the hands of Amond and Jace and the rest of them. Alicent tucks Viserys into bed and has a misunderstanding the size of strong Belwaz's belly. This is a very confusing moment for Alicent's character. When Viserys opens his decrepit mouth after taking a swig of heroin, he starts speaking nonsense, saying, You wanted to know if I believe it to be true. Alicent should immediately realize Viserys is having a moment. He was lucid all day when he affirmed Lucerys and made no mention of Aegon, but as soon as he drinks milk of the poppy, Alicent takes his word at face value. Viserys thinks Aegon is the prince that was promised and must be king. The audience knows that Viserys is referring to Rhaenyra, which is equally hilarious, but Alicent takes this misunderstanding and runs with it all the way to the Green Council. You could say that Alicent simply heard what she wanted to hear, that she's a schemer, and will use Viserys' drug-addled final words to her advantage 
in declaring Aegon his preferred heir. But that directly contradicts what happened just hours beforehand at dinner, when Alicent gives up her years-long scheme to crown Aegon and backs Rhaenyra. Are we meant to believe that now, all of a sudden, Alicent cares about Viserys' wishes? He told me he wished for Aegon to be king. It is the truth. When for the past two decades, she's been in direct opposition to Viserys' wish for Rhaenyra to become queen? She flaunts the privilege of her inheritance without shame. She expects everyone in the Red Keep to deny the truth our eyes can all plainly see. I think this was just written a bit sloppily. Alicent's motivations need to be consistent, not wishy-washy. Now she can use Viserys' final words as a shield that lets her give the throne to her son while simultaneously trying to remain friends with Rhaenyra. By this point in the story, Alicent's mind should be made up that she wants to back Aegon. She can still want to show Rhaenyra mercy, but now it seems like she's only backing Aegon because of her misunderstanding of Viserys' dying milk of the poppied words. It's also confusing just how quickly Alicent is willing to let go of all her anger and fear regarding Rhaenyra when she makes a toast to her at dinner. What about her fear that once she's queen, Rhaenyra, or Daemon, will kill her sons to solidify Rhaenyra's reign? Or her resentment of Aemon losing an eye while Rhaenyra's kids got off easy? Does all of this vanish when Rhaenyra makes this peace offering to Alicent? Maybe she's just tired after so many years of scheming and wishes to put all of that behind her at last. Or maybe she's just playing Rhaenyra, and deep down, she knows that when the time comes, she'll back Aegon for the throne. Because of the whiplash we get in the span of a single day, Alicent hating Rhaenyra, to backing her as queen, and then to reverse course and back Aegon as king again, it's just hard to get a sense for Alicent's motivations here. I think this could have been solved in two ways. Either cut Rhaenyra and Alicent's reconciliation and make the two lead characters clearly in opposition, or cut Alicent's misunderstanding of Viserys and have to deal with the Green Council happening despite wanting Rhaenyra to become queen. I'd prefer the first option, since Alicent and Rhaenyra becoming enemies is sort of what the whole story is predicated on. I appreciate how much more depth Alicent's character was given compared to Fire and Blood. I think her tumultuous relationship with Rhaenyra really works, and the writers did a great job of explaining how Alicent is caught between her love for Rhaenyra and her duty to her father and son. I'd just prefer if by the penultimate episode and Outbreak of War, Alicent was firmly in the green camp. Her last-minute race against Otto to find Aegon her patronizing book page that was supposed to make Rhaenyra feel better about losing her throne, her lack of control in the Green Council despite being the queen, those are the parts of Alicent I think are weaker. The show needed to decide how much power does Alicent actually have? Is she an active participant in the plot to crown Aegon? Or does it happen behind her back? The middle ground can be a bit confusing. Rhaenyra, like Alicent, is toned down from her book version. Neither woman is as ambitious as they are in the source material. They still have personal agency. Rhaenyra makes most of her decisions herself and is able to command Daemon, while Alicent administrates the realm with the unsavory help of Kristen Cole and Larys Strong. Both make difficult decisions that show their agency, but not their brutality. Alicent has to blackmail Diana after she is sexually assaulted, Rhaenyra is complicit in the death of an innocent servant. Alicent schemes with Otto and Vaemond to crown Aegon and take Driftmark away from Rhaenyra, respectively. Rhaenyra marries her uncle without asking Viserys' permission. So they do stuff, but not the stuff that makes them difficult to defend. In the books, Rhaenyra orders the death of Vaemond Velaryon and feeds him to Cyrax. Alicent hates Rhaenyra and plots to crown Aegon with zero hesitation. By taking away their sharper edges, the show makes these two main characters seem almost dull in comparison to the supporting characters on their sides. So I do wish Rhaenyra kept her ambition to be the queen because she wants it. For better or worse, book Rhaenyra would never have even considered letting Aegon be king for the sake of keeping peace. Her conscientiousness makes us like Show Rhaenyra more.
but it's okay for main characters to be ambitious and bloodthirsty at times. That's fun to watch too. Book Rhaenyra, upon hearing the Green's offer of peace terms after they crowned Aegon, said, Tell my half-brother that I will have my throne, or I will have his head. I hope Rhaenyra drops a line like this in Season 2. I don't think they needed to obfuscate Rhaenyra's ambition by giving her this divine purpose of Aegon's prophecy and making her reluctant to fight for the throne. And I don't think they needed to obfuscate Alicent's ambition by making her flip back and forth between her best friend and her irredeemable son. By the way, Game of Thrones did this too by taking away Jon Snow's sharper edges. In the books, Jon really wants it. I don't want it. I never have. Are you sure about that? He wants to leave the Night's Watch, to kill Ramsay, and to take Winterfell for himself. He forces Gilly to abandon her baby so Melisandre won't burn him. He has an actual personality and sense of humor, and he becomes a shrewd, adept politician. The main point is that these shows are taking away the brutal, sharper edges of its main characters in order to make them more sympathetic, and I don't think it always works. She is my queen. Layers of ambition and ruthlessness are needed as well. House of the Dragon has gotten a lot of criticism for the many accidents and misunderstandings which drive crucial plot points. Some of them I actually really like. When Aemon loses control of Vagar and accidentally murders Luke, that tells us a lot about Aemon's character and the reality of the world. Aemon knows he wants revenge against Luke, but he doesn't want to take it himself. But he will chase Luke on the largest dragon in the world to scare him, and it results in Aemon becoming a kinslayer. The themes of a dragon is not a slave, and Rhaenys' quote in episode 1 about boys playing at war, are exemplified perfectly in this one scene. Where the Aemon scene gets it right, the Alicent and Kristen scenes get it wrong. I already talked about Alicent's misunderstanding. It was a get-out-of-jail-free card that lets Alicent actively crown Aegon while remaining sympathetic to Rhaenyra. Kristen's accidental killing of Lord Beesbury, while not as big of a deal, I actually disliked a lot more. With Alicent, I at least see what the writers are doing. They're trying to maintain the connection between the two women while their respective men plunge the realm into war. And I like the show's dichotomy of Kristen acting honorable and chivalrous in public. Every woman is an image of the mother to be spoken of with reverence. While acting childish and unhinged in private. Spoiled cunt. But this would have been the perfect moment to start giving Kristen a lead role in the Greens. Have him purposefully cause the first casualty in the Dance of the Dragons and solidify Team Green's strength in the Red Keep not accidentally shove Beesbury down too hard and then wave his sword around like he's in GTA. It's just too childish for the guy who's supposed to be the kingmaker. Which brings me to my next points. These next criticisms aren't that serious, but there are some really cool parts of Fire and Blood they just left out for one reason or another. The main one is that in the book, Kristen is the one who convinces Aegon to take the throne. He tells Aegon that Rhaenyra will kill him and his brothers if he doesn't become king. In the show, he just has this cute little fight with Aeric, and then brings Aegon to his mother. At least they kept the part where Kristen physically puts the crown on Aegon's head, but why did they cut the part out where Alicent puts a crown on Helena's head? Helena deserved the crown too. I would also like to complain about the relationship between Rhaenyra and her siblings. It shocked me when I realized Rhaenyra and Aegon have zero lines together. They are the rival claimants to the throne, but they don't even say a word to each other. It's not like there's any important dialogue between them at this point in the book, but it feels weird for Rhaenyra and Aegon to have zero rapport. If they have dialogue with each other in future seasons, in the midst of war, it'll be the first time we ever hear them speak to each other. I would also also like to complain about the lack of Sunfire and Dreamfire. In the book's version of Aegon's coronation, Rhaenys isn't there, and Aegon takes a triumphant lap around the city on Sunfire, his beautiful golden dragon. One of the very few redeeming qualities that Aegon has is his awesome dragon. Maybe we should have seen Aegon and Helena fly around the city a bit, 
instead of Rainey's committing mass murder. I would also, also, also like to complain about some of the props. Did Ryan Connell really read the books? Because this crown, that I'm sure he personally handcrafted, is an imposter. I actually don't mind the silhouette. It looks like the architecture of Dragonstone, which is sick. But where are the rubies? Damon's dragon armor is awesome though. He looks like Elric of Melnibone, except without all the diseases. Is this Valyrian steel? HBO's website says the helmet is Valyrian steel, so it's essentially indestructible except for lightsabers. But I wonder if the rest of the armor is Valyrian steel too. This doesn't matter. The only omission I think truly hurts the plot is Daron, the third son of Alicent and Viserys. He's being fostered by the High Towers in Old Town, and we know he exists in the show based on George Martin saying he exists in the show. And there's a blood trail thing for him in the opening credits. He has a huge impact on the war, so I guess when we see some blonde kid on a blue dragon appear in season 3, everybody's just gonna be super confused. I imagine he'll at least have a cameo in Old Town this season, or at least Aegon or Alicent or Otto or somebody will mention he exists, right? I'm now realizing that all these complaints involve the Greens. I promise I'm not a Team Green Gigachad. I am actually Team Dalton Greyjoy specifically, but we can talk about that later. It just seems like a bunch of cool stuff from Team Green got shafted. Where is Sunfire? Oh boy, another YouTuber has an opinion on the rainy scene from episode 9. I just realized I don't care. Really though, this is the only scene in the entire season I actually completely dislike. In one instant, Rhaenys becomes a more prolific mass murderer than Mad King Aerys and Aegon the Unworthy combined. The Maely scene does play into a theme established by a Varys quote in Book 1. Why is it always the innocents who suffer most when you high lords play your Game of Thrones? But it's hard to remain sympathetic to the queen who never was after she needlessly murders dozens if not hundreds of civilians. You might argue that Rhaenys had no other option. She was trapped by her enemies. Well, what about this hole in the dragon pit where shown in the very first scene of the series? Could Melees have not flown out that way? She's a dragon. It was an intentional decision for Rhaenys to burst through the floor and directly confront the Greens. Now, obviously, Rhaenys can't Dracarys, Aegon, and Aemond, and the rest of them right there on the spot. That would be kinslaying, one of the worst sins you can commit in Westeros. But, from an objective point of view, killing them all is the most logical option. Murder a handful of people now instead of thousands in a war. But if Rhaenys does that, there's no show. House of the Dragon ends. So, if you're a writer, don't put Rhaenys in this position in the first place if the reason she can't make the logical choice is because the plot says so. I will say one, just one, nice thing about this scene though, besides how amazing Melis looks. Rainey's killing a bunch of civilians will probably set up a future plot point from the book very nicely. No spoilers. I understand that season 2 is completely written and filmed, so Ryan Condal won't be able to take my wonderful advice and apply it to the writing of next season. But let's recap my whinging anyways. First, I hope Season 2 continues with the complexity in Alicent's and Rhaenyra's characters we've seen so far. But there should be no more hesitation in either of them now that the war has begun. Especially now that her son Luke has died, I expect Rhaenyra to be fully mask off bloodthirsty dragon lady. If she looks at that book page one more time and considers calling off the war, I might actually have an aneurysm. Second, let's chill with all the accidents and the ambiguities. From here on out, every character's mind should be made up on who they'd like to kill and who they'd like to not kill. Third, keep in the cool details from Fire and Blood because they're cool and they make scenes cool. I'll put up a list of the things I hope are kept in the name of coolness, but they are a bit spoilery, so only pause and read them if you don't care about spoilers. But don't be afraid to keep making changes too. Keep peppering in nuance and subtlety where it's lacking in the source material. Quickly, because being positive isn't as fun as being negative, 
I want to discuss my favorite changes in the show. First, Viserys' characterization is far better than the way George wrote him in Fire and Blood. He says so himself. Paddy plays Viserys with a romantic tragedy that makes you want to sympathize with him and cheer for him, despite his relentless pursuit of a son which killed his wife, and his political ineptitude which caused the Dance of the Dragons. Brilliant acting, and Paddy not getting any awards recognition is a war crime far worse than whatever Rhaenys did. Also, my favorite two scenes in the entire series are between the brothers Viserys and Daemon in the throne room. First, their dramatic confrontation in the pilot, which tells us how badly Daemon wants to support Viserys, but only in his own way. This is then brought full circle in episode 8, when Daemon helps his brother to the throne, crowns him, and shows us that the entire time, Daemon never wanted to steal his brother's crown. He only wanted to help Viserys wear it. Daemon and Viserys' relationship is the most brilliantly written one in the show, in my opinion. Lastly, the best change by far is Alicent and Rhaenyra starting out as friends. Whereas in the book, Alicent comes off as this evil stepmother trope, the show gives us an interpersonal drama between two women which is able to be sustained for 20 years in-universe. The fact that they used to be friends still impacts the plot at the outbreak of war. Alicent, more than any other character, needed the most tinkering to give her some depth, and overall they did a great job. The only thing about their relationship I would change is to firmly end their friendship before the war, instead of reconciling at dinner. Their dynamic would be even more compelling and dramatic if it was portrayed as two best friends who grew to hate one another and become enemies. Instead, we got two best friends until Rhaenyra hates Alicent for a while, until they reconcile, and then Alicent hates Rhaenyra for an even longer while, until they reconcile, and then they're in this murky middle ground when the war begins. I'm very excited for season 2 of House of the Dragon. I thought season 1 was great, and season 2 has the potential to be even greater with more action, no time jumps, and more dragons. Let me know in the comments if you agree or disagree with any of my points, and what you'd like to see in season 2. Thanks for watching and subscribing.